welcome to a quiet spot in the grounds of St Mary's Chalcombe. It's our informal worship time from the benefice here at St Mary's and also with St Stephen's up the hill in Lansdowne. My name's Andrew Menko, I'm the curate here and it's wonderful to be with you today. This church is a hive of activity especially today there's a wedding rehearsal going on a couple preparing for an exciting and blessed day tomorrow and there's lots of activity in this little hamlet too people working on their houses and the wildlife singing their sweet songs out to us today we're looking at Ascension Day, which was this past Thursday. It's the culmination of Jesus's earthly ministry. But it isn't the end of his story. So this being informal worship, grab a cup of tea, get yourself comfortable. We're going to delve into it together. The ascension of Jesus is, comes at the end of 40 days after his resurrection, where he's spent time wandering with his disciples, meeting with people, and firmly establishing that he's not dead, he's alive. It's also a time when he's helping to continue to prepare the disciples for the time when he won't be with them, at least physically. It's also the time when Jesus appears beyond the Gospels by in person, sight and name. The writer of the book of Acts is Luke, Luke's Gospel. So you see Jesus appearing. Luke's Gospel and Acts are essentially, you know, you consider them as one book. Certainly it's worth a recommend reading the two together. It's something we're doing as with my youth group and they're loving it. But before we delve into those readings, we're going to have a moment of prayer, a moment of silence too with the songs of wildlife, of nature. And the prayer is written specially for this time of commemorating and remembering Jesus's ascension into heaven, back to his Father's side. So let's pray. Risen, ascended Lord, as we rejoice at your triumph, fill your church on earth with power and compassion, that all who are estranged by sin may find forgiveness and know your peace. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. We're going to have the readings in a chronological order and begin with a gospel reading from where Jesus prays for his disciples. You'll find this reading in John's Gospel at chapter 7, 17, beginning at the first verse. And there'll be a link to this and the other reading and then the prayers in the description below with this video. So Jesus praying for his disciples as recorded in John's Gospel chapter 17 starting at verse 1. After Jesus had spoken he looked up to heaven and said, Father the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified on earth by fin finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I've made known your name 
known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words you have gave to me, I have given to them. And they have received them and know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I'm asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one, as we are one. And our second reading comes from the book of Acts. It follows Jesus out of the Gospels and into that book. And we start at the sixth verse of the first chapter. So when Jesus and the disciples had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this a time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it's not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, indeed to the ends of the earth. When Jesus had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of sight. While he was going and they were gazing up towards heaven, Suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus, whom you have, take, who you have been with, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then the disciples returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, about a Sabbath a journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with women, including Mary the mother of Jesus, as well as his brother. That was the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So take a moment to let that soak in. I wonder whether you find thoughts that you've had appearing in the books you then read. It can feel spooky. Often it's not a coincidence even though, because you've been, if you've been thinking about some topic and then you look to see what other people have been thinking about the same topic, it's what, what you're bound to find similarities at times. But maybe it's more than that. Maybe sometimes it's a sign that you're in tune, that you're along a right path, in tune perhaps even with what God wants to say to you or to others. Either way, I'm grateful for the writings of Tom Wright and Paul Williams this week especially, because their thoughts on the passages chime so well with mine so together with them, with each other, let's delve into the ascension. And I wonder, as we start, how many times in your life have you heard or actually asked the question, are we nearly there yet? I certainly remember 
asking that a lot as a child. But I did have to contend with a lot of long journeys from where I lived to be here in Bath where my grandparents lived. I can remember the frustration and disappointment when the answer was no. But whichever direction we travelled, for much of my childhood, we would inevitably come off the M4 at Junction 18 and I would begin to see the familiar sights. Deerham Park, the Tea Room, Freezing Hill Lane, the race course, the green fence of the then MOD Fox, MOD Ensley in Lansdowne. The excitement would build. The destination was almost upon us. And the giggles would start because I knew any moment we would arrive and I would hear my grandparents say the immortal words, my, haven't you grown? Well, the disciples asked Jesus in our reading, are we nearly there yet? They were still expecting him to restore the people and the kingdom of Israel. And he hadn't done that yet. They'd seen and understood enough with Jesus that Jesus was appointed as God's true king of Israel. Despite his resurrection, indeed because Jesus was walking and talking with them since the first Easter day, they were still expecting him to renew and restore Israel. But what they were expecting isn't necessarily what Jesus was delivering. But they hadn't reached that destination, whatever the destination that they understood it to be. They were still traveling to that moment when Jesus had promised that the kingdom would be restored. Surely it would be soon, surely it would be now. The signs were there. No person, no king had done what Jesus had done. No person, no king was as powerful as Jesus. Jesus, divine in nature and appointment, still had a job to do. The Holy Land would soon be freed from occupation, rid of its oppressors from within and without. Which is why they asked, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? Jesus' reply doesn't help much. He replied, it's not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Had Jesus just expanded the territory that the newly restored Israel would rule over? That had been alluded to, promised even in the scriptures that the disciples knew that we share in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament. Have a look at Psalm 72 and 89 and Isaiah chapters 40 to 55 particularly. So what Jesus said once more spoke into their world understanding and into the not uncommon view amongst Jews that Israel would rule over the world. Yes, they didn't expect their king to die such a violent death, but he had been resurrected. So surely the bus it was business as usual. The plan must be back on. Now nothing could stop Jesus from fulfilling his mission, his destiny. The kingdom had been transformed by Jesus' death and resurrection, but not in the way they likely imagined. I know that you all know that we read this story in hindsight. But if we were to try and immerse ourselves in the disciples' experience, we might imagine that by now they still could grasp what Jesus had meant, both before by what he had told them before his death and what he told them now. We might imagine that they understood Jesus was talking not of an earthly kingdom, but of a heavenly one. 
we might imagine that they understood the big picture but isn't it but it isn't easy to do when you're in the middle of it they were still in the picture being painted still in the story being written yet with the story they had lived and breathed with jesus they knew enough to th to know to believe that it must be coming to a conclusion. Surely, the Holy Spirit Jesus was signalling to meant the final destination was imminent. Surely, they were about to see God's kingdom grow out across the world. With all that has come, all that they had come to understand with Jesus, it's no wonder that they were asking, "Are we nearly there yet?" Of course, Jesus' reply wasn't a simple no or a time of arrival. Instead, he had done what he did. He did what he had done before. He tried to explain, "We're not actually going there at all," and I want you to tell the global global empire about it. You see, in the first century, when kings were enthroned. Their new authority would take effect through messengers travelling throughout their territory in question. They would take the news that they had a new king. That was always proclaimed as good news back then. Because in the ancient world, they knew that anarchy is always worse than government. Governments may be bad, but chaos is worse. And with Jesus proclaimed as king, not just of Israel, but of the world, the messengers, the disciples had a lot of ground to cover and a lot of people to tell. Yes, that would take time, but in a few days time, they would have the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit would arrive with them in Jerusalem and accompany them on their travels. Now we take a moment to think what they may be thinking. It lines with what Jesus' response, reasons for, for betraying Jesus is often put down to. Jesus was frustrated, impatient and disappointed that Jesus was not delivering the political restoration of Jesus and freeing them from their Roman oppressors. The disciples didn't see, weren't that far off from that sort of thinking because they fully hadn't fully understood what Jesus meant. Our readings captured some of what Jesus wanted them to know and us too before he commissioned them to prepare for the coming kingdom. Jesus wanted them to know that the plan still waiting to be realized was more than removing that which oppressed and corrupted this global earthly kingdom. It was more than restoring it to how God had been created and intended it to be. God's plan was for this new and restored earth to be joined, not as parallel worlds in a multiverse that is so in favour with blockbuster movies in recent years, but fused into one. In other words, the earth and heaven are both just temporary places. All who claim to all claim, either as their home, will be together in this new, united and transformed world. If the disciples lived and understood that that was God's intention in our time, they'd probably paraphrase a different movie, a certain fishy movie and say that we're going to need a bigger kingdom. The disciples were in the in-between time. They were waiting for the full realisation of Jesus's global kingship and kingdom. They were waiting for the Holy Spirit that Jesus had promised would empower and enable them to play their part in it. And though we live with the fulfilment of the Holy Spirit, we are in the in between us too. We are still waiting for that kingdom restoration and realization as well. And like 
the disciples, we know we're not at the beginning of that journey there. They thought they were nearing the end of the journey to the new kingdom. But the 2,000 years that have passed have taught us that the journey is still continuing. We can look at the state of the world and see the end times described in the Bible, but we can't tell how nearly there we are. We can't tell how nearly then we are either. Whilst we wait in our temporary heaven or earthly home, for the kingdom to arrive. We have the same challenge that the disciples had, to live and tell the story of Jesus by attending to the people and places that need to be loved and cared for. The story of Jesus is a powerful gift, a gift given to all of us. It's a gift of life that not only helps shape the world around us, but calls to be involved in the shaping. The story does not simply reflect how things are, but calls us beyond ourselves to a kingdom that is larger than the boundaries of geography, nationality, culture, and even time itself. Just as the disciples were, we are called to be God's fingers and feet while we attend to our current kingdom and wait for this new kingdom to arrive. Like the disciples, we are called to be witnesses, to live, tell and apply the story. We're called to get busy, not because we're afraid of Jesus catching us napping or sleeping on the job, but because there are lives being lived that need to be loved in the in-between time. Even though we don't know how nearly there we are, we do know where we're heading, to that kingdom, that kingdom of heaven and earth still to be one, but with one already appointed and enthroned king. And whilst we wait, whilst we continue towards a full realization and restoration of the creation and God's kingdom, Rather than worrying about the end times, let's focus on the journey. Let's treasure, tend, transform, teach and tell of the sights, sounds and smells of God's kingdom showing itself on the way. And let's have a listen to the, some of those sounds now. Just as I'm grateful for Tom Wright and Paul Williams and their thoughts on our passages. I'm also very grateful for John Pritchard, former Bishop of Oxford. He's written a lot of very good books. His book, The Life and Work of a Priest, is essential reading if you're going to explore your sense of calling to ordain the ministry. It's an absolute classic. He's written some wonderful books of prayers. And we're going to use some of his prayers for ascension now. So let's pray. The response to the words, Jesus Christ is Lord, is to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Lord, be the ascended one in our church where too many things of little importance can often distract us from the few things of major importance. 
when our vision is small and our faith is thin. Remind us again of your towering beauty, reigning over all things. Give your church here such a vision of your glory that nothing on earth can compare and nothing can tear us away from our faith. Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Lord, be the ascended one in the community of nations. All around we see signs of violence, war and terrorism. And the world is running out of time to save the planet from irreversible damage. And yet there is another reality. A new world has already broken in. Your kingdom is established just under the surface and justice and peace are within our reach. Lord, Help us to live in the old world and there proclaim your new kingdom. Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Lord, be the ascended one in our own society. So often it feels as if our culture is tired, adrift in its own relativism, not knowing what to value and what to live by. We pray for those who influence the health of our society, the government and parliament, journalists and broadcasters, broadcasters, writers and filmmakers, local councils and voluntary organisations. And we pray in silence for any such people who get under our skin or we can see need our prayer. Give to these people courage to stand for something, lest they fall for anything. And may something, the something be good, just and true, in terms of your kingdom. Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is Christ, our Lord. Be the ascended one in our own hearts, for that's where the main struggle goes on. Be our Lord not in theory only, but in daily application. Be the Lord of our values at work, of the way we relate to our closest family, of the way we spend our money, and of what we do when no one else is looking. Be Lord of how we spend our time, and how we vote, and how we handle our sexuality and approach difficult ethical decisions and issues. Be the Lord of how we relate to the wider world and its needs, of how we sing and celebrate and enjoy this world's gifts. And may we be able to say with joy that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father, now and in all eternity. Amen. It's been great to spend this time with you here in a corner of St Mary's Charlecombe to worship together. I hope wherever life finds you, however life finds you, whether it's comfortable or difficult, that you will have a blessed week ahead. Comfort where you need it, guidance where you need it, joy where you need it. Let's end with a blessing. God the Father, who has given the Son the name above every name, strengthen and proclaim, strengthen you to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. God the Son, 
who is our great high priest, passed into heaven, plead for you at the right hand of the Father. God the Holy Spirit, who pours out his abundant gifts upon the church, make you faithful servants of Christ our King. In the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Take care. God bless you. Goodbye.